the leaves are falling, the weather is getting chilly, and Christmas and fall decorations are being sold at the same time. The Halloween season has begun, or if you goth like me, do say. With Halloween around the corner, many urban legends and ghost stories will be spread around this time of year to help you get spooked for Halloween night. The Clifton Bunny Man is a story based on a well-known urban legend about an escaped convict by the name of Bunny Man, who got the name from the half eaten corpses of bunnies found around the area. On Halloween night, at the stroke of midnight, he would kill anyone who was hanging at the Colchester Overpass, now nicknamed the Bunny Man Bridge. Although now that I think about it, that would technically mean he would be committing murder on November 1st. You know, because it's past midnight, I mean, it's not Halloween anymore. And I guess this guy doesn't mind pulling the Treehouse of Horror. Pathetic humans, they're showing a Halloween episode in November! Given how the story was written, it's implied that the man's spiritual essence has been committing the murders of many innocent people who were at the wrong place at the wrong time. It's pretty complicated unless you read the story, so let's get into it. Decent story on the urban legend, it just felt silly despite its high body count. The tale of the bunny man goes back many many years. Originally, it didn't start until 1931, after many murders had already been committed. For verification of the story, you can visit the Old Clifton Library, located in Clifton, Northern Virginia, USA. What I'm about to tell you is entirely true. Although I've never seen the Bunny Man, everyone in Clifton believes it to be true. Back in 1903, deep in Clifton, there used to be an asylum buried deep within the wilderness of Clifton. Pretty soon after the Civil War, people started inhibiting the area, population-wise, around 300 or so. It was a very small town. Nevertheless, people didn't like the idea about having an asylum miles down the road. So they all got together and signed a petition staying for the asylum to relocate elsewhere. The petition passed, and a new asylum was built, which is now known as Lorton Prison, a temporary facility until convicts are appropriately sentenced. In the fall of 1904, the convicts were gathered and piled into the bus, which was to transport them to Lorton. Somehow during the drive, not too far from where they left, the driver had swerved to avoid something, and the bus had started to tip, and soon was falling into a terrible collision course. Most of the convicts were injured, but had managed to escape the bus, and had fled into the night woods. Later on the next morning, a local police investigation had begun and they had begun rounding up the escaped convicts. Hours turned into days, days into weeks, weeks into months. Everyone was recovered after four months, except for two people, Marcus A. Walster and Douglas J. Gryphon. During the search for both men, the police randomly found dead rabbits, half eaten and dismembered every now and then along the search. Finally, they were to find Marcus dead himself by the Fairfax Station Bridge, now known as Bunny Man's Bridge. In his hand, he held a man-made hammer knife-like tool, made with a sharp rock and a pretty sturdy branch as a handle. They thought nothing and cared not of how he died, only that he was apprehended and no longer had to worry about him. They had a name for Marcus, but later on, they would realize they named the wrong person the Bunny Man. Still searching for Douglas, they kept on finding dead half-eaten bunnies every so often while the search went on. Finally, they were to name Douglas the Bunny Man from then on. Three months passed by, and the police had given up their search on April 7th, 1905. Everyone assumed the Bunny Man was dead by now, if not gone, so they went on with their small town lives. Come October, people started seeing dead bunnies reappearing out of the blue and started to fear the unseen. Halloween night came around, and as usual, a bunch of kids had gone over to the bridge that night to drink and do whatever kids did their age in the 1900s did. Midnight came around within minutes, and most of the kids had left. Only three of them remained at the bridge. Right at midnight, supposedly a bright light back from within the bridge where the kids were shined, and less than a couple of seconds later, they were all dead. Routes slashed, 
with the same type of tool that was found by the other escapee, Marcus. Not only were their throats slashed, but all up and down the chest were long slashes gunning them. To top it off, the bunny man hung both the guys from one end of a bridge with a rope around the necks, hanging them from the overpass with the legs dangling in front of the pass of cars. For context, the bridge is a one-lane car road passing underneath a dual railroad track above it within the woods along a gravel road. The woman was hung the same way, on the other side of the bridge. This happened on Halloween in 1905. After that, they didn't see or hear anything from him for another year. Halloween 1906 was approaching, and parents as well as the teens in Clifton still remember the incident that had occurred one year ago at the bridge. His bridge. Bunny Man's bridge. That night, seven teens were left remaining right before midnight at the bridge. Thinking little of it, six remained inside the bridge, while one, Adrian Hartella, had remained a good distance from the bridge, hoping to have enough time to escape if the same thing happened again. At midnight, she witnessed only this. A dim light walking the railroad track right before midnight, stopping right above the bridge at midnight, then disappearing at the same time as a bright flash was inside the bridge. She heard the deafening sounds of horrific screams coming from inside the bridge that lasted only seconds. Five seconds later, they were all hung from the edge of the bridge, same style as the corpses a year earlier. Horrified, she ran home. She didn't tell of everything she saw, just spattered words here and there that some of the folk put together to come up with her story. No one understood or even believed her. They charged her with the murders and locked her up in the asylum of Lorcan. In 1913, the same thing happened with nine teenagers this time, Halloween night again. Adrian was still locked up. They dropped her sentence, but it was too late. The insanity had finally conquered her. Even if she was released, she was far too gone to have a decent life. So she spent her remaining years in the asylum until she finally died in 1953 of shock. No one knows what exactly she died in shock from, but supposedly she had died in her dreams, dreaming of that one dread night. Perhaps the bunny man had finally gone to her. More murders were to take place, however, although after the murders of 1913, most people stayed clear of the bridge on Halloween. 1943 rolls around, and six teenagers go strolling out on Halloween night. A couple hours later, all of them dead, same way as all the others. Investigations took place, but as usual, nothing was discovered. 1976, the same situation occurs, this time with only three people. The only other incident that occurred since then was in 1987, 12 years ago. Janet Charlieter was enjoying the night with her four friends. Halloween night had finally come and had gone driving out to enjoy the night after invading the children's candy bags. They had settled around 11 at the bridge, waiting for midnight to come. They didn't believe in the myth, so they decided to see it for themselves and were bound to be the only ones who actually withstood the bunny man. They had waited around 55 minutes or so, almost at midnight, until Janet started getting a little scared. They all had been pulling pranks on each other like jumping out of the bushes and screaming, so she was already a little worked up. Midnight hits, while she is completely freaked out. She is almost out of the bridge, when the lights get really bright inside the bridge. When this happens, her body is halfway outside the bridge. She sees that her skin is starting to tear at the chest, but nothing is piercing her skin. She manages finally to exit the bridge. Completely horrified, she hits a hanging body, and knocks herself out. When she awakes, she finds that her hair has turned white and she has been bleeding. She was lucky that the cut had just started. It wasn't very bad at all. She left and never returned to the bridge again. She has been sitting on a swinging bench on her balcony every morning, just staring in the direction towards the bridge a couple miles down. To this day, you can still fire on that bench every morning. From then on, the story dwells on touch and unmoved. Halloween night. 
you will find a bunch of people hanging around the bridge, drinking and smoking up. But within minutes of midnight, everyone leaves. It's been like that for the past five years that I have visited the bridge on Halloween night. Even if it's not Halloween night, any night you go there, you feel the presence of Death Awain, Awain the night sky and Halloween yearning for more blood to be spilt in the name, in his name, Bunny Man. <laughs>